Welcome to this event. It's a special event. It will be a conference and roundtable discussion about quantum cryptography. Uh, so many of you know that there is currently in Paris a conference of quantum, about quantum cryptography, which is called the QCrypt 2014. It's part of a series of conferences. But uh, in addition to this conference, we decided to uh, organize this event, which is a more open event. That is, uh, among you, there are people who are at the conference, but there are also people who are invited and free to come, uh, who are maybe just interested by this subject of quantum cryptography. Uh, and so uh, we thought it would be nice to have sort of an interactive evening uh, in which, during which you can ask questions uh, about this subject. So uh, it's also a special opportunity because uh, uh, quantum cryptography was actually mostly created uh, in eight, 1984, uh, which is just 30 years ago. So it's the 30th birthday of quantum cryptography. And as, as you will see later, there will be many events uh, with, which are associated with birthday uh, and, and linked to quantum cryptography. So the main point this evening is that this quantum cryptography was created by these people, and you can check the match. <laughs> they, they are here, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, what we propose to proceed is that I, there will be sort of a first organized part. We will tell you about quantum cryptography. I will uh, give a brief uh, introduction about what it is. Then, obviously, uh, Charles, Gilles, uh, Arthur, and Peter will tell you more. It should take about one hour, and since we have two hours, there will be another hour uh, of open questions, so you will be able to ask everything you wanted to ask uh, about uh, quantum cryptography. Okay, so let's go. So, uh, as you know, in uh, quantum cryptography, as you probably know, there is a little folklore. Uh, there are actually three people. Uh, there is a Bob, there is an Alice. So Alice and Bob are two people, there may be you and uh, uh, your bank, uh, who want to communicate uh, in a secret way. You don't want anybody to hear what you are telling. But then there is a bad guy who is actually called uh, Eve. So this is a uh, eavesdropper in English which is a sort of a abstract person which want to uh, break your secret, that is to know what uh, the message, to know the message which is exchanged uh, between Alice and Bob. So how to do that? So the, the most used way actually in order to pro protect secrecy of a message is to use what is called a secret key. So uh, if your message is a string of bits, let's say it's letters, uh, a secret key is basically just random bits but they are known both by Alice and Bob. So they have pre-exchanged the secret keys. There is no message, no information, but it's just a key. And given a key, it's possible to do an operation like which is called encryption. Basically, you, you process the message and you get an encrypted message here. Uh, with a, you close the lock. Uh, and then this encrypted message can be exchanged publicly on anything, internet, whatever you want. And the trick is that since Bob's has the key, Bob has the key, he can open the lock and get back the message. Uh, there is even a better trick, that is if your key is as long as the message, uh, and if you just uh, make uh, what is called addition modulo 2 for each bit of the message, then you get perfect secrecy. So actually this method is completely secret, nobody can break it, provided that your key is perfectly random, that is, it is known only by Alice and Bob, which is as long as a message, so this is pretty stringent, and also used only once, so it's called a one-time pad. So this is very nice, theoretically, but nobody really does that. In principle, one uses shorter key, and then the processing, closing the lock, is much more complicated. But still, uh, one can get a good secrecy with a secret key, and this is what uh, is used on the internet, for instance. So now the, the problem clearly will be here because you have to exchange the key. And so if there is an uh, Eve, we saw, saw all kind of nasty technology, uh, she will try to steal the key. And if she steals the key, she will be able to read out the message uh, without Alice and Bob knowing, which is a really bad, bad thing. So how to exchange the key? So there are various ways. You can just carry uh, it in a bag but this is sort of dangerous. The messenger can be seduced, can be uh, killed, can be whatever. Uh, a more uh, reasonable and more widely used pro thing is, is called public key distribution. It is to use algorithm calculation. Uh, so then uh, basically just by exchanging data of internet, you can build a secret key 
But there are assumptions for the thing to be uh, secret. And basic assumption, for instance, for this method of encoding is that factoring, that is splitting a number in prime vectors, is very difficult. And we will come back to that later. So this is very simple, but it's no, there is no proof that this is absolutely secure. No, no proof. It, it might be broken with a classical computer. And if there is a quantum computer, if a quantum computer can be built, it can for sure be broken. Uh, and we will also come back to that later. Okay, so now we come to quantum key distribution. So what is quantum? Where, where quantum, what is quantum important in this subject? This is obviously about exchanging the key. So what was proposed by these guys uh, 30 years ago was to change this uh, key exchange channel into a quantum channel. And then one can use the laws of quantum mechanics to make the key exchange completely secret. And then uh, whatever nasty she is, uh, Eve cannot do anything. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the uh, idea, and this is what we want to speak about. Uh, this is, what is this quantum channel? Uh, how to proceed that, and can it be used uh, in the real world, let's say? So the story is something like that. Yes, it was started uh, in the 70s by Stephen Wisner, who is not here, unfortunately. And then, uh, but you will hear more about him. And then these people, uh, Charlie, Jill, Arthur, and Peter, uh, developed the thing uh, up to a point which is very advanced now and which is basically uh, ready to be used uh, in real life. We use some elementary uh, quantum particles to carry uh, information. And we can use, for example, polarized photons of light. And actually, I make a lot of polarized photons from this thing. I shouldn't look at the front end of it like that. Oh, yes, yes, there. There. Yeah, okay. If enough you, enough you, photons for all of you to see. If you want to make even yeah. more photons, you can okay, use this yes. one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have some photons. Uh, if we just have uh, a one at a time, uh, the photons can be polarized in different directions by basically by changing the, the position of the source. Uh, and they, you can use a photon to carry one bit of information. Uh, and if the photons are horizontally polarized, as you can see up there, uh, they will pass through a, a, a horizontal compared to the crystal of calcite or any other uh, asymmetric material. They'll pass straight through, uh, and you can uh, uh, count them. Uh, let's say call them zeros if they're horizontal. But if they are vertical, they will be deviated as they pass through that calcite crystal. And so you can use horizontal and vertical photons to carry one bit of information in each photon. However, uh, if you supply the photon at some other angle, for example, by tilting the source to 45 degrees, you get photons that uh, behave probabilistically when they get to this calcite crystal. And instead of perhaps what you would expect being deviated by an intermediate amount between going straight through and deviating the maximum amount, they behave uh, randomly. And that means that you, uh, you get this uh, unpredictable behavior from the photons. Uh, and the probabilities are this, uh, uh, add up to one, cosine squared and sine squared of that angle. Now, uh, Measuring, so I, I, this is a way that you can get one bit out of a photon if you know how to use it, but if you don't know how to use it, you will get less than one bit because it will behave randomly. Uh, and there, you try to make some end run around this by, is there some way of measuring a photon's polarization exactly? No, it, it, this is not possible. What about taking a photon and multiplying it into many photons? Uh, no, that's not possible either. But you say, here I'm holding in my hand something that multiplies photons. As you know, a laser uh, stands for uh, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So if you make a very symmetric laser and you send in one photon, you can get out two of exactly the same polarization. That sounds like the beginning of cloning photons. However, lasers don't work well at a very low level of input. And if you try to use a laser on an input strength of one photon, just as likely you can get two photons of the same polarization out, or this one photon plus a photon of random polarization. And so that 
amount of noise that is necessarily injected by a laser also prevents you from gaining more than one bit of information. So there's a uh, limitation from the uncertainty principle from fundamental laws of physics of how much information you can get out of one photon. But this means that it has uh, some usefulness because we can, well, I should say, well, this, is, this, is, this was a mystery of quantum mechanics and uh, one of our, uh, at least with uh, Gilles and me, collaborators, uh, Professor uh, uh, William Wooters at, uh, at uh, Williams College says, how do you explain how a photon behaves when you, when you measure, or how any quantum particle behaves, probabilistically? Well, you say, uh, it's a little bit like those old-fashioned schools where, the, where the, the students were not supposed to answer except when asked by the, the teacher a question. They weren't supposed to say, oh, oh, I believe, the, what do you mean by that? No, that was forbidden. So uh, here's the photon. The teacher says, are you vertical or horizontal? And the student says, well, I'm polarized about 55 degrees away from the, I believe I asked you a question. Are you vertical or horizontal? No, horizontal, sir. Uh, did you ever have any other polarization? No, sir, I was always horizontal. Uh, so that's how things behave in the quantum measurement. Uh, and this means if we have know beforehand that we're going to send vertical and horizontal photons in and only those, we can use them to carry a bit of information for each photon. Correspondingly, if we rotate the whole apparatus and supply only diagonal photons, 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees, we can also carry a bit of information with those, but there's no way to distinguish all four kinds. And that is the basis, or this kind of fundamental limitation is what leads to the possibility. Uh, well, I mentioned here quantum money. This was really the, one of the first inventions based on this, uh, and quantum cryptography. Now, quant quantum money, uh, you, in, in the old days, I don't think the euros have this, but in the old days, the, the uh, francs. Does anybody here remember francs? Uh, I still have a few. Yeah, or, or also the uh, Deutschmarks. Would have printed on the, on the money uh, a message that says, if you, if you copy this money, if you duplicate it, you will be punished by some number of years in prison. Now, uh, so in principle, any Familiar objects can always be copied. And one of the inventions of Wiesner, which led to us, Gilles and me, to think about this quantum cryptography, was money that is physically impossible to duplicate by somebody who doesn't know the secret that was used in preparing the money. And yet the bank, who does know the secret, uh, can check that the money is valid. And here's how it works. Uh, there's Wiesner in 1968, roughly. Uh, now, up there, you can see the money contains uh, 20, oh yes, okay, I'll point it like that, 20, <laughs> uh, 20 boxes, 20 boxes that have, each one has a photon in it, and they're perfectly reflective boxes. Now, uh, there's nothing in physics that prevents a perfectly reflective box, but in fact, the best mirrors that we have, the photons would live for a small fraction of a second. So this money is only good in places with very big inflation. Uh, but if you look down at the, 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 uh, the logo on the money at the bottom, in who, who here uh, can read Latin? Anyone can read Latin? That's even before Franks. Uh, <laughs> it says, non duplicabor, which means I shall not be duplicated. It doesn't prohibit you do, it doesn't punish you because it's not possible to do it. So here's what happens. If you try to read those photons one at a time, you don't know in which axis to measure them, and therefore they will behave randomly, and the chance of all 20 uh, not being disturbed by your process of reading is three quarters to the 20th power, which is, if there's a reasonable punishment for trying to pass bad money, that's enough incentive. So this is the paper down below where he explained quantum money. And this was a paper that he wrote during the student uprising at Columbia University in 1968. Probably many of you don't remember 1968. Uh, that uh, he circulated in manuscript for many years, and I was one of his friends, and I thought it was really exciting. 
Uh, but m most people didn't think, didn't know what to do with this uh, idea. And this leads me on to the next uh, speaker. Oh, no, don't do the slide. Oh, I tipped this. Wiesner um, had this great idea, um, and he submitted to a journal which rejected it, and then he didn't really push the, uh, push the issue, except for talking to Charlie about it, and Charlie talked to various people about it and usually got a blank reaction. But then, uh, about 10 years later, in November 79, and this is a true story, I was <coughs> swimming in the ocean in Puerto San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, minding my own business, when a complete stranger swims up to me, I never met him before, and the stranger starts telling me with no provocation on my part that he knows how to use quantum mechanics to make money that is uh, impossible to kind of fit, um, which is kind of an unexpected uh, <laughs> event. Uh, you think you can get away from that sort of thing by going out into the water on the beach. Right, <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, a life-changing event in this case. And contrary to most people to whom he had talked before, about Wiesner's ideas, uh, I listened. And, and by the time that we swam back ashore, I had found a way to improve it, because as Charlie explained, uh, Wiesner's money can only be checked by the bank uh, who made it, so it cannot be spent uh, in, in a store, because the, the merchant has no way to check that the money is valid. It can only be ch spent at the bank where you got it, which is kind of useless. Not only is it only good for a millisecond, but all you can do with it is put it back in your bank account. <laughs> uh, and, and, but, but then uh, I, the, the field of public key cryptography was kind of new at the time. I had just finished my PhD on this subject. And, and, and I immediately saw a way to use public key cryptography to, to make these banknotes possible to spend, possible to verify. So that anybody could verify validity, but yet only the bank could make uh, valid, valid, valid banknotes. Um, and this led to our first paper. But um, many years later, I had a postdoc who liked this story so much that he made his best drawing ever. Uh, oh, sorry. So, so that's, the, that's the paper. So, so yeah. that, 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 that's the uh, Wiesner's paper. Um, and and, and the, um, so the drawing made by my student was this, which describes uh, Charlie. Uh, he had more hair, actually, at the time. Not much. Look at that. It's about well, the same. I said at the time. It was 30 years ago. Uh, 35 years ago, actually. Uh, and that's me. And, and this really represents the meeting of physics with computer science. Um, and and that, that, that's how uh, quantum cryptography began, although the very first paper we wrote uh, after this meeting, the ocean, uh, was in uh, Crypto 82. This is an annual conference. It's been going on ever since. In fact, the first crypto was in 81. And at Crypto 82, we had this paper in which, for the very first time, the words quantum cryptography appeared in print. Uh, but it, it, these were the banknotes, the improved banknotes. Um, and then, um, oh, and by the way, um, the, the really funny thing is that, is that when, when I thought I had made an improvement to Wiesner's idea by bringing in public key cryptography, in fact, my, my main improvement was to make them computationally secure only so that it could be broken with, with enough computing power whereas the original banknotes were unconditionally secure. Um, and, and the funny thing is that, 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 that we have here the person who has found how to break my banknotes, uh, because uh, we'll hear from Peter Shore how to factor big numbers, uh, and, and that's enough to break these banknotes. But, but then, uh, by a reversal of fortune, um, uh, Peter is also working on, on, on saving the idea and making banknotes that even he could not break. Uh, but he won't talk about that, I think. Anyways, so that was the first paper. Uh, and then um, Charlie and I realized that, that this was really kind of silly because, because photons are not, are not meant to, <laughs> 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 sorry, uh, photons, photons are not meant to stay, to stay put, they're meant to travel. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and so, so, so then, we, then Charlie and I thought of, we could use these ideas not to make banknotes but to, to communicate. And that, that's when we thought that we could use all these ideas to send secret messages, to, to do really do cryptography. Um, and our first paper about that was uh, written in 1982. Uh, it was submitted to a main major computer science conference called STOC. It was rejected. Um, and, um, but it would be published this year. This paper, this 1982 paper, would be published this year for the first time. Uh, it's kind of 
strange, but it, it's, it's an especial issue to commemorate the 30th anniversary of VB84. Uh, and, oh, um, I'm sorry, hello. Good. Um, in a nutshell, the idea is, is that because, as, as Charlie explained, quantum systems uh, cannot be measured, and if you try to measure them, you will disturb them, and particularly th that's why they cannot be copied, but also they cannot be measured. So the, the very high-level idea is that if Alice sends a message to Bob in the form of polarized photons of these four different kinds, any eavesdropper who will try to, to, to monitor the message will create a disturbance, which is unavoidable and in unpredictable, so that what Bob receives here will be different from what Alice had sent. And by using appropriate protocols, uh, Alice and Bob can detect this disturbance. So that's really the basic idea. Um, and then, right? Um, well, it was, as I said, this paper was never published un until this year, but we did get a technical disclosure, an IBM technical disclosure about it, uh, which is now discontinued. Um, and then we had really, but, but then we, we, st we stopped working on this because we had a better idea. And the better idea is what is known as VB84 today, uh, about which I will say a lot more in a minute. But VB84, despite its name, was first presented in 1983 at a conference, uh, an I IEEE, uh, information theory conference in 1983, and that was the first time that BB84 was presented officially at, in the public. Um, but the proceedings of this conference only had a one-page abstract per paper, so we didn't have space to, to give the protocol. Um, and it was in 1984 that this paper ca came out in a somewhat obscure uh, proceedings conference, um, and, and that, that we were celebrating the 30th anniversary in December of this event. So that was, that was the first page of the paper, of BB84 paper, and that's where public uh, quantum key distribution came out for the first time in, in that paper. Uh, and just for your enjoyment, this is, this is what a protocol looked like in, the first, in its first uh, instance. Um, as you can see, photons were drawn by hand at the time. And this paper, BB84, we also uh, come out in a journal for the first time this year, in a different journal for the same purpose, uh, again, to celebrate the thir 30th anniversary. All right, now here's how it goes. Uh, I'm going to explain BB84 very quickly, for those who don't know. Um, the idea, the basic idea is quite simple. So um, Alice will choose random photons of these four kinds that, that Charlie uh, said, so either horizontal vertical or the two diagonals. And everybody agrees, this is, this is, not un this is, this is known of the eavesdropper, that uh, vertical means one, horizontal means zero, and plus 45 means zero and minus 45 means one, or vice versa. But there is some code that everybody agrees on, including the eavesdropper. So each of these photons really means one bit. However, just like the quantum money, it's not possible to read it without disturbing it. If you don't know in which basis, the bases are either rectilinear or diagonal. So if you don't know in which basis it was prepared, no apparatus can read the bit that's hidden there. So now Alice will send these photons to Bob, and Bob uh, and, and Alice and Bob have no secret in common initially, so Bob doesn't know how to read each of these photons, so he's going to choose a random basis. For each photon, Bob chooses at random in which basis to read it. The basis is an axis, basically. Yeah, the basis is an axis. Yeah. Yeah. It's an axis, either like this or like that. And each time that, if everything is perfect and there's no eavesdropping, then every time that, that Bob, half the time in, uh, on average, makes the right measurement, he will get the right answer, and half the time makes a wrong measurement and gets a random answer uncorrelated to Alice's bit. So what we can see here, in the, in the first case, uh, Bob made a right measurement, he got a right answer. In the second case, he made a wrong measurement, he made a diagonal when it was horizontal, and he got a random diagonal. And sometimes he gets nothing at all either because the photon doesn't get there or because it's not, it's not detected. In fact, most of the time he will get nothing uh, with current technology. And then, um, but then he, so, 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 so about half of these are correct and half have no connection with what Alice has sent. And at this point, Bob will, t and at this point, Bob will tell Alice over, over a normal classical channel which bases were used, not the result of the measurements, but only which bases are were used. And Alice will report back which were correctly, by chance, measured. And, and all of those which were correctly measured, if everything else is perfect, uh, lead to a bit that Alice and Bob share. So whenever Bob made the right measurement, 
the bit that he measured, or the photon he measured, is exactly what Alice had, had prepared. So about half the photons that Alice sent initially, minus those which are not received, uh, uh, become common to Alice and Bob. And at this point, uh, now they can be translated from polarizations to bits, zeros and ones with the coding that I said in the, at the beginning. And, uh, and these bits, in fact, will be shared between Alice and Bob uh, if, if, if there's been no disturbance. But there could be disturbance, there could be errors. An, an, an eavesdropper, if there is an eavesdropper, then some of these bits are, are erroneous. And therefore, Alice and Bob have to check. So there's some number of, of processes afterwards by which they will check that there, there were no errors, or there, there were errors, not too many. It would correct the errors. And, but everything from here on is, is classical. And at the end, either Alice and Bob d decide that there were too many errors, meaning too much eavesdropping, and they give up. Or if there are not too many errors, they're able to repair them and take away from the eavesdropper any information that she might have obtained by eavesdropping the quantum channel and eavesdropping also on the classical channel. And this is not an obvious proof. It, it took 10 years to get the proof, the first proof of, of unconditional security, uh, assuming that, it, that, that it's, it's built properly. Uh, so then, um, at the end, there is a secret uh, between Alice and Bob, and this, if this secret is long enough, it can be used as a one-time pad um, to, se to send a message. So the actual message does not enter the game until the key has been established, and therefore it is completely s secure, because it will only be sent over the channel through the one-time pad, only if Alice and Bob are convinced that you have a, se a secure secret key. Very well. Um, well, this is a one minute and a half movie that, that, that that, that says the same thing I just said. I think this movie is really nice. So uh, Alice and Bob agree that let's say zero is horizontal and one is vertical. And in the diagonal basis, that's zero and that's one. And now, um, they, they have these little machines. Alice, as I explained, Alice chooses random bases, random bits, which uh, amounts to randomly polarized photons on the four possible directions. And Bob chooses random bases. Again, the bits are the axis, as Charlie said. Bob also chooses random bases, and then, he's, and, and then Alice uh, starts sending the photons to Bob, and Bob will measure them. And every time that Bob makes the right measurement, the correct basis, he gets the right answer, and otherwise he gets something that's uncorrelated. But at this point, they don't know. Uh, Bob doesn't know which were measuring the correct basis. And so they measure, uh, send and measure, and send and measure. And at the end, um, um, as you see, the, the, the data bits between Alice and Bob are not the same because when it was a wrong measurement, there's a random answer. But now they will exchange bases. They will, on, on, the, on the classical public channel, they will exchange bases. And when the bases were the same, they will keep the bit. When the bases were different, they will drop the bit. So about half the bits will be discarded because they were measured in a wrong basis. The other half are kept. And whichever are kept, again, if everything else is perfect, will be the same for Alice and Bob. And that will be the key. On, no, the key on, on which some post-processing has to be done to make sure that, that there's been no eavesdropping. <coughs> Very well. Okay. okay, I'm sorry, you don't want to. Your turn. <laughs> so, as you understood, everything started around 82, 83, 84, and then uh, QKD was starting developing, slowly developing. Uh, and then at the beginning of the 1990s, there were two big events, which are, as you can guess, the two next people <laughs> <laughs> on this table. Uh, so one of them, the first one, so we heard about Wiesner and Bennett Brassard 84. Uh, these uh, protocols, QKD protocols, now are called prepare and measure protocols for obvious reason. You, you prepare the photon and then you send it, Alice prepare a photon and send it to Bob. But then there was a new idea, which was actually to relate <laughs> this QKD uh, story to entanglement. And entanglement is basically a very big physic physics issue in quantum mechanics. It's the einstein podolsky rosen uh, paradox, etc. And this idea was introduced by uh, uh, Arthur Eckert, who is here. Uh, and he published it also in Physical Review Letters. So it has a big impact on physicists. Uh, at this time, QKD was developing slowly, but I must say that not many physicists uh, were still in the game. Uh, after Arthur's paper, physicists really got interested, uh, and then it was the, the uh, real, there was an increased development of the field, and you will also hear about the next part of the story. Okay, so. Um the, my part, or my story about uh, how I entered into this field, 
is, uh, starts with my PhD in Oxford. Um, I, you know, I have probably many PhD students. I started my PhD on something that uh, uh, was related to quantum optics, and, um, and it was about the squeeze states of light, but my interest was um, always in the foundation of quantum physics. And, uh, and somehow I jumped from one topic to the other, and I didn't know about all those exciting developments that uh, uh, Stephen Wiesner, Charlie Bennett, and Gilles were working on. At the time, there was no archive, so those, those results were not published in any journals that I had any access to. And so my, my, um, I had some interest in, in cryptography in general. I was fascinated, but it was more at the sort of recreational level. And for me, the the crucial idea, this, you know, this moment of illumination that comes sometimes, then you know that you come across something very fascinating, very interesting, something good, was when driven by interest in, in the sort of early development of uh, uh, foundations of quantum physics, I went to the original Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen paper. And reading this paper, I found this phrase that uh, in which as you probably know, this paper is about the completeness of quantum theory, about Einstein being very unhappy about uh, this new uh, description of, of nature, of physics, and the laws of physics, and, and, and sort of being a bit concerned that it might not be quite right, and comes with interesting arguments and trying to, trying to show that if you take quantum physics, that you may have some problems in associating what he calls element of reality with physical quantities. And there's this sentence that goes like this, if without in any way disturbing a system we can predict with certainty, that is with probability equal to unity, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. Then I thought, wow, if you want to really learn about something, about certain physical quantity, without disturbing it in any way, that is exactly the definition of eavesdropping in cryptography. So, if I can then design a system where somehow you can, you know, you can somehow deprive this physical system of this element of reality, that I may be able to certify for for the lack of eavesdropping. So, so uh, my idea was uh, somewhat different, and you heard Charlie talking and Gilles talking about polarized photons. So in my particular case, I was interested in cases where a photon may not have, uh, for some really fundamental reason, a polarization attributed to it. Um, so you may ask yourself the question, is there a, a, a physical situation where a photon uh, do not have any predetermined values of polarization, like in the prepare and measure protocols? So. And indeed, you know, there are sources of entangled photons where uh, you may consider a very simple experiment in which uh, you have a source of photons. There are two photons. They are generated by the source. They fly away. And then suppose you have two parties, Ellis and Bob, and they want to measure uh, polarization of photons. And suppose that indeed Alice can measure two different types of polarization that I call here a1 and A2, and uh, Bob can measure two other polarizations that are called B1 and B2. And, and suppose indeed for every single pair of photons you can attribute a value, say plus one or minus one in H bar units to, to, the, um, to, to A1 and A2 and B1 and B2. So think about it as a binary random variable of some sort. And if you can do that, then you can consider a very simple quantity. There's just a basic piece of mathematics that you can see here. There's this another random variable s. And you can see that if b1 and b2 are only plus or minus a 1, then one of those terms in the brackets has to be equal to 0, and the other one is equal to plus or minus 2. So s has to be either plus 2 or minus 2. And if you just average over different realization, the average value is somewhere in between. So, uh, so this statement is basically known as a, um, as a, 
there's another form of Bell inequalities, which tells you this, that if you make assumption that there is a real element of reality, if there is a value associated with each particular photon, then this, this component S has to be somewhere between minus two and, and two. And, uh, and if, uh, if, if it isn't the case, then you have a problem. So that you know, one conclusion you can draw that there, there isn't, uh, it, it isn't the case, there isn't value associated with a photon. You cannot a priori by any prescription whatsoever attribute those values. And we saw in, in experiments uh, those inequalities violated, so therefore my, my argument then was very simple. From this moment onwards, you know that you have something interesting and the argument goes in few points. It goes like this. So photons then, there are cases, there are physical situations where photons do not carry predetermined values of polarization, right? So if the values do not exist prior to measurements, then nobody could really uh, knew about those values because they didn't exist until they measured by Alice and Bob. So hence, indirectly testing for the violation of Bell inequalities was testing for eavesdropping, and that was, that was my way of thinking about the whole thing. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, I knew at the time that uh, there are many beautiful experiments, some of them performed here in Paris, uh, one of them even by the chairman of this meeting here, Philippe, uh, that, that convinced physicists that uh, however weird it is, uh, physics is weird, so there are situations where you cannot attribute physical quantities to, to objects, and therefore you can, you can deprive those carriers of information from binary values. They, they, they are not there until you measure them, and you, you, you can know whether someone else measured them or not. And that was beautiful, and I really like that fact. And then um, on the experimental side, I was trying to, I, was, I didn't know about the work of uh, Charlie and, and, and Gilles at the time, and I was, I was trying to talk to quantum opticians, but, um, but they, they didn't like the whole idea at the very beginning. And then um, and the one person who, who really uh, was very encouraging, who, who actually recognized the value of it, someone who became my mentor later on as supervisor was David Deutsch. And, uh, and, and he even then said, look, I actually, it may be not such a good news for you because you're so excited about this, but there was someone else who also thought about it and he knew about Charlie's work and this is how I learned about uh, BB84. Well, you know, of course, you know, my, my ego was a little bit dented, as you can imagine. There's this, you know, I was a, this eager PhD student, but nonetheless, I still enjoy the fact that I discovered something interesting. And then I, I found two really great experimentalists. They were working for what used to be called Defense Research Agency in Mulver, not far away from Oxford. It was Paul Tapster, ingenious experimentalist, who is, was much more interested actually in playing bridge than doing experiments. But, <laughs> Um, and therefore, he never went to any conference. So probably you never saw Paul Tapster at any quantum optics conference, but you probably saw John Rarity because John Rarity worked with Paul Tapster, and Paul was this naturally. You wouldn't see him at a bridge conference. Well, that might be the case, but you know, the, the Paul was naturally born experimentalist who could really just turn. Uh, you know, there, there are those people who are. I, I'm not one of them, but but you know, I admire experimentalists who just go to the lab and can make things happen, and they just have this another ability that, that some of us can only dream about. So Paul was in, in this league, and, and John Rarity was, was an excellent experimentalist and very good communicator, so John was able to tell the road that, that you know, how, how those experiments were done. And I persuaded my colleagues to try to experiment with those ideas, so they used parametric down conversion and they just um, set up the system. The problem was at the time that Defense Research Agency was under Ministry of Defense in the UK, and in the UK the cryptography should be done by Foreign Office, and you know the GCHQ is under Foreign Office, and MLD was not supposed quite to do cryptography, so we had to write few lengthy uh, memos and so on to persuade the management that after all this experiment is innocuous, it's maybe not cryptography, it's some kind of fundamental physics. And then the reply came, well, if you don't aim your laser at the tank, it's not research. So, so um, you know, the MLD, Ministry of Defense, has its own view of what the research is. But, 
but finally uh, John and Paul uh, got this experiment running, so it was it was it was really nice. Um, so this, uh, I don't think I'll just, I'll probably stop here. Okay. Uh, I think this nice cartoon comes from Ben Schumacher, who was trying to explain this notion of... Um, who do explain that, maybe. I love that one. Well, the cartoon <laughs> is nice. Uh, is, yeah, you want to explain this, Charlie? Or? Yeah, this is how entanglement works if you don't like uh, the square root of two and things like that. Uh, the two particles get together in the middle and they form some kind of diabolical pact. <laughs> and so that after they go apart and, and uh, cannot influence each other, they each behave randomly, but somehow whichever particle uh, has thrown his dice first, if the other one throws the dice in the same way, they come up with the same answer. <laughs> Um, so, yes, you I can think in summary, um, Philip asked me to summarize this. Um, the, you know, there was sort of like uh, two paths to, um, uh, to what we call quantum cryptography today. There's, you heard about uh, prepared and measure that happened chronologically earlier. Uh, then uh, this entanglement base, even though I haven't thought about entanglement, I thought about this element of reality. Then, of course, those two converge in a nice way. So, for example, entanglement was used to, um, to construct security proofs for BB84. Um, but what I'm, I'm very proud of is that somehow this thinking about this notion of reality uh, led into much later, of course, and it's, it's certainly, it, it's actually a good example that sometimes your ideas are more clever than you are. Uh, that is, that is like, you can, you can, Come, I haven't quite seen what some other people pointed out later, that how little assumptions you can make about the, uh, the system, and that led into what is known today as a device-independent cryptography, but that's another story, so we don't have to go into this. Go on with the story. So we are now in 91, uh, so the next big blow was in uh, three years later, in, in 94, uh, 20 years ago then, so I come back to this slide that you have already shown, which is basically the most used present uh, way to make public key distribution. It's called RSA, it's Reverse Shamil and Adelman. It's an algorithm which is based on, on the fact that it's very easy to multiply to very large number, but it's very difficult to split them uh, in two parts. So if you, if you are just given the product, it's very difficult to split the product uh, in two large numbers. And uh, all the security of, of the thing, actually most of the security on internet, for instance, is based on this RSA algorithm. So the big blow came in 94, due to Peter, where Peter proposed an algorithm which was basically telling that if you were able to make a quantum computer, we will speak, uh, tell again what it is, then factoriz factorization, factoring, it becomes a very easy problem. Uh, so this was really, really a big blow. I will ask Peter to tell more, but just to, I think there, there was sort of a panic uh, almost at this time. Uh, so this is just a confidential thing, for instance, it's just an example of a confidential paper, which is sort of a wave, it's, it's a recent one, but it's confidential, but you can find it on the web, so it's not so confidential. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what it adds, exploring how quantum computing will break standard-based security system used on the internet, uh, exposing past, present, and future data, and the availability of suitable alternatives. So basically, the, the idea is short algorithm. Uh, if you have this so-called quantum computer, then factoring becomes easy, and then uh, there is a threat, and the threat cannot be ignored, even if we, if we don't have yet a quantum computer. Uh, this is a serious threat uh, about all this public key business. So now I will tell, ask Peter to tell us more. <laughs> okay, so what is a quantum computer? Well, the real, I mean, the real interesting thing is a quantum computer is essentially a physics experiment. So you can ask, what is the difference between a computer and a physics experiment? And one answer is that the computer answers mathematical questions and the physics experiment answers physics questions. So for example, if you want to factor two large numbers, you think you would ask a computer. And if you want to test whether all bodies fall in the same weight, you probably would not want to use a computer. <laughs> so. That's one difference between computers and physics experiments. And as, I, as um, <laughs> Philippe says, 
um, fact fact that factoring can be done on a physics experiment possibly much more efficiently than on a computer it was a great surprise. So there's more. There's another answer. Um, if you ask anybody right now, a computer is a little box that sits on your desk. We have one right here. And a physics experiment is a big, custom-built, finicky piece of apparatus that probably fills the whole room. And if you're talking about you know, particle accelerators, it fills a huge amount of land um, in Switzerland. But um, we can go back and, oops, yeah. come on. You want to next one? <laughs> there is yes, it's something wrong here. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. There yes. we go. Okay. So if you go back, um, let's see, 50 years, we have a picture of a physics experiment and a computer. And, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about the, um, <laughs> the resolution, but you can see that there's a very similar looking technician adjusting both of them. And they're both <laughs> big rooms full of equipment. And you can ask what happened. Well, what happened is <laughs> that you don't need to build a new computer for each mathematical question you want answered. And you do need to build a new physics experiment for each physics question you want answered. So computers had the great advantage of mass production. And you know they. Um, became small and essentially commodities. And physics experiments are still custom built. And this fact is actually related to some deep mathematics and is called essentially the Church-Turing thesis. And you know, the Church-Turing thesis was a, you know, a thesis that was really deeply embedded in the consciousness of computer scientists and the fact that physics experiments might be better at solving mathematical problems really came as a great surprise to most of them and shocked some so much that they still don't believe it. <laughs> so another thing about the um, Church Turing thesis is that the public really understands it. So journalists, you know, one of the first questions journalists ask about quantum computers is how much faster are they than classical computers? And as Gilles pointed out earlier today, this is really a wrong question. It's, um, there's no one number that says how much faster are quantum computers than classical computers. They're much better for factoring. And they're no better at all for some tasks, like for sorting. You really cannot use a quantum computer to do any better than a classical computer. But for factoring, you know, a classical computer might take 10 to the 50th steps for a number that a quantum computer will take 10 to the 20th steps for. So that's um, a big difference. So how did I discover um, the factoring algorithm? So I don't have any slides on this. I <coughs> but um, the first I saw of quantum of, well, the first <coughs> paper on quantum computing was David Deutsch wrote a paper in 1985. Did I? No, 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 not too well. Just go on, go on. OK. I, I First, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think I might have. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I understand. I, <laughs> <laughs> now I understand. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so. This is a physics experiment, but it's right. easy it to fix. <laughs> yeah. David Deutsch um, in 1985 wrote a paper defined a quantum Turing machine and you know, said it might be better than a classical Turing machine. But if you read the paper carefully, it seems that he doesn't actually think so. <laughs> but um, a few years later, um, David Deutsch and Richard Joza came up with a, a, a problem for which a quantum computer was very slightly faster than a classical computer. and. Um, I guess um, Umesh Vazirani and Ethan Bernstein. Ethan Bernstein, who was his graduate student at that time, started looking at it. And did, Ethan, did Umesh Vazirani look at it because you introduced it to him? Or I'm not sure. You're not. I'm yeah. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, Umesh Vazirani started looking at it, and he and Ethan Bernstein came up with a 
very contrived problem for which a quantum factoring, a quantum computer was somewhat better. And then Dan Simon, who was, um, uh, I guess. My postdoc. Yeah, your postdoc. Yeah. Started thinking about this and started trying to prove that a quantum computer couldn't do anything better than a classical computer. And he worked on it, and he worked on it, and he came up with an algorithm that actually a quantum computer was exponentially faster than a classical computer for this one problem. So he started to disprove this, um, you know, this um, thesis, and it turned out that it was he actually proved it. <laughs> so um, that's is around where I came in. I had seen. Umesh Vazirani's paper because Umesh came and gave a talk on it at um, Bell Labs. And this was shortly before it appeared in the stock conference. And Dan Simon's paper was submitted to the stock conference. And I was on the program committee for the stock conference. And I got Dan's paper. And I, got, I saw Dan's paper. I got really excited about it. I thought it was a great thing. And then we went to the program committee meeting. And the paper ended up being rejected. <laughs> so. I really should have clearly argued for it more strongly in retrospect, but <laughs> I, did, I, I at least have the advantage of knowing that I did argue for it. <laughs> Just not, <laughs> I wasn't jumping up and down and saying you have to let it in. <laughs> anyway, Dan Simon's paper used the idea of periodicity. And if you know something about cryptography, you know that the two really important Difficult problems for public key cryptography are discrete log and factoring. And discrete log is very clearly based on periodicity. So I had an idea that maybe I could solve discrete log <laughs> using a quantum computer. And so I started working on it. And sometime in April, I figured this out. In April of 1994, I figured this out. So. Um, what I did then was I, well, first I told Jeff Legarius about it, and he pointed out a small arithmetic mistake I made, which I fixed. And then I, maybe a week or two later, I gave a talk in Henry Landau's seminar at Bell Labs. So Henry Landau has a, had, was running the seminar every week, and you know, people talked about various mathematics questions. <clears throat> and so I talked in a seminar. And then I went home. I got a bad cold this week at, that weekend. And on Sunday, I got a very excited call from Umesh Vazrani, who said, I hear you've been able to solve factoring on a quantum computer. Tell me about it. Now, there's something very funny here, which is that I'd given the talk on discrete logarithms. And at the time, I didn't know how to factor on a quantum computer. And somehow, during this chain of tele, of tele, <laughs> this game of telephone, you were somebody for the telephone company at the time. Right? I was. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, someone told someone, told someone, and Umesh Vazirani heard that I could factor. And luckily, it happened that in those five days, I'd figure out how to factor on a quantum computer as well. <laughs> so, I spend an hour on the telephone with Umesh telling how this worked. <laughs> and a couple of weeks later, I got a call from The Economist. And they want to do an interview with me about quantum factoring algorithm. And I have no idea how it got from Umesh to The Economist. <laughs> I've been told David Deutsch might have been in the chain, but I don't know for sure. Um, we don't know Arthur. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's your country. If I knew, I couldn't tell. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, and I kept getting lots and lots of email asking me for my paper, which I had not written yet. <laughs> and I got a call in early May. So this was maybe three weeks after I discovered it. No, I got a call in late April, maybe three weeks after I discovered the algorithm, inviting me to talk at the Algorithmic Number Theory Symposium, which is an annual conference. I think this was the first one in Cornell. 
in early May, so I went up and gave a talk there. Umesh Vazrani gave a talk about this in a Santa Fe um, you know, workshop on the foundations of physics. And the news just spread incredibly fast. And so you know, the beginning, so both David Deutsch's paper and Umesh's paper were um, written in terms of quantum Turing machines. And my own paper was originally written in terms of quantum Turing machines. But in the time between uh, the time I you know, wrote the first draft and the time I wrote the final draft, I started trying to explain this thing to physicists. And physicists cannot understand quantum Turing machines. <laughs> but they can understand the quantum circuit model. So what the quantum circuit model is, you start with, so a qubit is just a two-state quantum system like a polarized photon. You start with n qubits and you apply quantum gates where you make them interact in pairs and to do some specified sequence of quantum gates and then at the end you measure the particles. So this is a circuit model for quantum computation and if you think about it in terms of physics experiments, it's much, much, much easier than building a quantum Turing machine where what you have to do is you have to um, address quantum memory in superposition, so you're looking at one spot of quantum memory depending on this other piece of quantum information, and this is first both really difficult to think about, and second, incredibly difficult to do. Of course, the quantum circuit model is incredibly difficult to do too, because we still don't have a quantum computer with more than around 10 qubits in it after, um, I guess, 20 years, but it's much, much easier than quantum Turing machines. <laughs> so let's see. Okay. Okay. So I will maybe sort of finish the story of uh, quantum cryptography. So now we are end of the 90s. So uh, experiments are developing. Uh, physicists are definitely uh, interested in the thing. So for instance, there is this paper. This is a review paper already in 2002 by quantum cryptography uh, by the Geneva Group, which is led by Nicolas Giza. Uh, then uh, experiments keep developing, so there are, uh, initially there was Alice and Bob, and then there was Alice and Bob, and Charlie, and Daniel, and uh, okay, <laughs> more and more people. Uh, so this is the idea of quantum networks. So there was a nice quantum network which was uh, built in, uh, in this project, which was a big European project. So it was built over Vienna in 2008, it's sort of an example of development. So it's really a network in the sense that there are secret nodes, so you have here these uh, seven secret nodes, with all kinds of links. Uh, which are all the point, point to point uh, QKD links. And the idea of these networks is that if a link fails, you can use another one, you can share the key. Uh, so there was a whole protocol able to share the key. So it was sort of serious. It was at the scale of a town of Vienna in, in Austria. Uh, and the whole size of the network was typically about 100 kilometers. So uh, this, what was nice also, it was a sort of a review of the state of the art uh, at that time. Uh, there was a, well, the, all these links were done with different technologies and more or less all of them were present. There, there was a, something developed in uh, the group of Nicolas Gisin, uh, it's called CAO, uh, Coherent One-Way System. There were several commercial systems, as you know, there is an co important com commercial company, ID Quantique, so they had several of these links. There was one which was based on uh, one wave weak pulses, which is uh, built by Toshiba, by Andrew Shields, who is uh, here at this conference also. Uh, there was one on the continuous variable, you heard about this uh, this morning by Pinkoy and others, uh, which was developed in our group in collaboration with Thales. And there was also an entangled one, uh, really the Eckert protocol, uh, which was uh, implemented using an uh, entangled pair of photons, which was developed in Vienna. So since then, there have been other ones. There was another one in Tokyo uh, in 2010. And we heard this morning that there are plenty of them in China now. Uh, at least four Chinese towns have an uh, internal uh, intra intracity uh, network. Uh, so there are also a lot of uh, other things. It's a lively subject. There is this conference, but there are many other conferences, both on uh, applied and theoretical aspects of uh, quantum cryptography, even post-quantum security. Uh, so I think uh, we will take questions. But before we take questions, maybe I ask the four people here whether they have a last comment before we take questions, or we just go for questions, uh, as you wish. All of these things could have been discovered much earlier. 
And you wonder why the, in the early days of quantum mechanics in the 30s and 40s, in the early days of computer science, also 30s, 40s, 50s, and information theory, they, they didn't think of it. And I think uh, uh, I was asking this question of Nicolas Jussain. I don't know if he's in the No, he, he has to leave. He, he has to leave. Yes. And I said, is it because in the early days they thought of quantum mechanics as having to do with microscopic objects and computers as macroscopic, big, big objects? Because they didn't have the miniaturization of computers, they didn't have the genetic code, and so on. And he said, well, that might be part of it, but he thinks the real reason was that uh, most physicists, and, and through them most people in the general public, thought of quantum mechanics as being a limitation. Measurements that you couldn't do, or set compare, uh, joint measurements that you couldn't do. That, and therefore, they jumped to the conclusion that a quantum computer was just a classical computer that didn't work as well. <laughs> and a quantum communications channel was just a channel that you couldn't get rid of all the noise on it. Well, well, but on the other hand, uh, that you cannot measure it is good if it's the eavesdropper who can't measure it. Well, that's why I think that, this, that the essential, uh, well, of course, I think you could say that uh, Feynman thought that there must be some additional computing power that would come from a quantum uh, uh, computing. But the thing that really brought it into the ocean, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, awareness that it was useful, was this a positive application of something <laughs> negative, which was the application to uh, quantum money and to cryptography. That is, using a, a limitation to, to your advantage in a adversarial situation. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a general remark I wanted to make. Thank you. So okay, so we go for questions. So, but Charlie, you had in the seventies yourself written a paper about the limitation of reversible computation. So you yourself thought that quantum computing has a, is a, lim a limit. Yes, yes, not that not that big. Yes, I, I, I was I thought this way too. Yes. I have a question uh, for Peter. So I ask a question about the future. When do you think we can have a quantum computer to break RSA? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's, I certainly don't think we'll see one for a decade and you know, quite possibly for much longer. I mean, there's lots of people who are trying to build them and they're doing remarkable things. If you look back in, 1994, when I first um, developed the, you know, developed the factoring algorithm, Jeff Kimball, who's a very good quantum experimentalist, said, "Well, we can do maybe one quarter of a quantum gate on two qubits." So now we're doing, you know, tens or hundreds of quantum gates on five or ten qubits. So this is a uh, big improvement, <laughs> but you know, you're going to have to do billions of quantum gates on thousands of qubits to factor, and that's still an enormously far, long way away. Even if a quantum computer is sometime in the future, um, the main, I w what I would say is the main defect of classical cryptography is that it can be broken retroactively, by which I mean that as, as we speak, messages which are encrypted, sent over the internet, even if they're encrypted by methods which today cannot be broken, like RSA, maybe can be broken today, uh, that does not prevent uh, a potential eavesdropper from taking it down and storing it because classical information can be copied without any restriction. So the eavesdropper just takes down and, um, and take, takes down all this traffic which he cannot understand waiting for the day when a quantum computer becomes available, and then retroactively he can go back and read all this old mail. Now, if you entrust to the internet today your credit card number, well, continue to do that. It's not very risky, 
Uh, if, if, if in 20 or 30 years, a $1 million quantum computer can access your credit card number of 30 years ago, you don't really mind that. <laughs> However, if you entrust your uh, data, which, is, which you would like to keep secret for your entire life, like medical history, then you're taking a serious risk because you don't know when a quantum computer will come up. And when it does, what you thought in the past that you were encrypting safely, you weren't. Uh, and if you're using classical cryptography to encrypt national security secrets, well, you're just crazy. So this, this and, and, and one of the main advantage, maybe the main advantage of quantum cryptography is that even though we haven't spoken about that, but quantum cryptography um, is, gives perfect security if it's implemented perfectly. But actual implementation can have flaws, which some people in this room know how to uh, profit from. Um, and so, but, but nevertheless, quantum cryptography has to be broken if it is broken at all, while the transmission is taking place. You cannot do it later, it's too late. Whereas classical cryptography, you can break it retroactively, as I said. So the short answer to the question asked to Peter is that we don't know when there would be a quantum computer, but when there is, if there is, then all the previous secret communication is no longer a secret. Can so I? We should not wait until disaster to change the paradigm. So maybe I'll, I'll provide a third answer to your question. So, um, building a quantum computer might be a very interesting achievement, but probably the best scenario is when we realize that we cannot build a quantum computer for some deep fundamental reason. In this particular case, this is actually for physicists the most wonderful scenario, right? Because you discover something new and profound about nature. At the moment, we are pretty much you know, we know that we can do it. It's a question of doing quantum error correction, fault tolerance at a certain level, getting the precision there. But imagine that one day you discover that there's something fundamental that prevents you from building a quantum computer. And that, that's the best case scenario. So I think not being able to build a quantum computer for a good reason is the best. <laughs> Absolutely the best. Oh, I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, er, physicists and, 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 and mathematicians all have their own ideas of which ideas are beautiful and ugly. <laughs> but, uh, for example, you mentioned, uh, 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 Peter mentioned uh, uh, Simon, who was trying to prove one thing but prove the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, I. I think that the, although I know that, that, uh, that Arthur is a physicist rather than a computer scientist, the, the most of the people I know who think it would be beautiful if quantum mechanics were refuted uh, are, are not physicists. <coughs> physicists similarly are probably not likely to be thrilled by the idea that, uh, that, uh, that you can travel faster than the speed of light or something like that. It, you, you, it would be exciting but in a very but, but surely, Charlie, it will be refuted sooner or later, right? Do no, you I don't think so. Well, no, not, not in the same way that, that uh, I think it's comparable to a special relativity. It will be transcended in some way, but not refuted. It will refuted. be transcended. I mean, refuted as it is, but transcended by a better yeah, physical theory. I don't, the people who think that you can't build a quantum computer, I think they have... I think they, <laughs> they are... So, the future of quantum mechanics yeah. is maybe <laughs> too far fetched <laughs> <laughs> for the discussion. Well, if I, if I may nevertheless, in this case, I agree with Arthur. Oh, yes, oh, because, oh, because, oh, because physics... For the first time. For, <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, okay, be, so... Be, be, because physics has... Back to Earth. <laughs> you know, really, physics, the, the, the most important progress in physics has happened because of catastrophes. And this would be a catastrophe. I don't think it's a likely catastrophe. Oh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, some other questions? Uh, yes, down there. Yes, uh, around 2000, uh, Clifton Boob and Halverson, and then uh, other people later, came up with the idea that uh, one can use no-go theorems or results such as no-bit commitments, so theorems in quantum computing, including cryptographic principles, as foundational principles from which to derive quantum mechanical formalism itself. What do you think about this idea? Who else uh, until? Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm not extremely expert in it, but I think it's a fascinating idea, and I think there has gradually been some progress. People are 
uh, many people are unhappy with the foundations of quantum mechanics and would like to see it on a, a foundation that looks simpler and, and less uh, abstract and mathematical. And there have been many efforts to restate the laws of quantum mechanics. And most of these are, they're not, they don't contradict one another. They are expressing the same hard to express idea in different words. And I think that's a, f a very fruitful uh, direction of research that I find quite interesting, even though I don't really do it myself. Well, yes. I, yes. just to continue yeah. answering, mm -hmm. um, this is indeed a very fruitful research direction, uh, which I advocated very strongly many years ago. And um, the idea that uh, one could rederive all of quantum mechanics, at least the information theory part of it, from the possibility of um, secure communication and the impossibility of bit commitment. Uh, I, I, I propose that, actually, uh, as a joke, mostly. Uh, I, al although, although I would have been very happy if it had come out to be true. Um, and some people worked on these ideas and, 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 and got a long way uh, in slightly different axioms, got, got a long way towards getting quantum mechanics. But then it was mostly nailed down by Giulio Caribella um, and, uh, and his collaborators in, in Italy. Um, where they were able to, to, to obtain, to, to base quantum mechanics, um, not as a theory of waves and particles, but really as a theory of information, uh, in, in which uh, by uh, some number of postulates um, that are entirely reasonable, from these postulates they could prove that the only solutions are classical and quantum mechanics and then they added one last postulate. It's somewhat like Euclid and the fifth postulate. So they added one last postulate, which, uh, which, which really has to do with entanglement um, and, in fact, purification. And with this postulate, then classical physics uh, goes down, and the only solution is quantum mechanics. So yes, we, we, we can really arrive quantum mechanics, at least great portions of quantum mechanics, from purely information theoretic axioms. And I think that's a very important uh, research direction. So Charlie raised this qu question, why wasn't all that discovered much earlier in the early days of quantum theory? And I would like to ask kind of the opposite question. So if you look at how people, how seriously do people today take this whole development? And if I go, for example, to in an information theory conference, then it's still mostly classical. The same is true for most cryptography conferences and so on. Someone could argue that still today people haven't maybe realized how at least in my, important, in my opinion, how important and fundamental this development was. So what's your opinion? I mean, this is a question maybe to all of you. Why is it still the case that this whole field of quantum information hasn't, is still kind of in some way a niche? So for example, when you compare its size with the whole size of, of classical information theory, it's still a very um, small field. And also when you look at teaching in in, in most universities, um, students learn a lot of, for example, classical information theory, and only in certain places they also learn by standard quantum information theory. The same is true for complexity theory. I mean, they learn probably classical complexity theory, although we know that this is not the physically relevant complexity theory, unless Arthur is right with his, um, or if this um, best case scenario happens. So, in some way, we are still mostly behaving in, in most academic fields as if this whole development didn't take place. So my question is, what's your, I mean, do you agree with that statement? And if yes, what is your explanation? I have an opinion about that, yes, but probably other people do. But my opinion, in, in short, is uh, there have not yet been very practical applications on the scale of classical computing and, and classical information theory. So. If you take something that was at one time a very abstruse and arcane principle of uh, theory of computation, such as the halting problem and the existence of universal Turing machines, the result of Turing, most people didn't understand them until, uh, until recent decades. 
Now every person who, who goes to a computer store and buys some software and says, oh, do you have this thing, this software available for my Macintosh instead of the PC, they implicitly understand uh, the notion of a universal computer, which at one time was a very <laughs> abstruse notion. And if you talk about, oh, my hard disk is getting full, I have to compress it, uh, they understand Shannon's theorems much better than Shannon thought anybody would ever understand them. <laughs> so I think what's, and we have, we have certain practical applications of, of quantum cryptography. Quantum computers are not functioning yet to, to, for, to solve useful problems, but it's, it's not a, a billion dollar industry in the way, or a multi trillion dollar industry the way, the way the information revolution has touched everybody. It's the, the classical information revolutions so far. Well, I, my answer would be that uh, it only shows a lack of foresight. Uh, and just to continue on what I was saying previously, um, to continue to entrust our secrets to systems that can be broken retroactively and for which we have no idea when that will happen um, is just about, just slightly less absurd than continuing to pollute the planet uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and not do anything that we should do to reduce uh, green gas effects and that, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're, we're heading toward disaster, we know it and we continue. Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I pretty much share uh, Charlie's view. On this. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, agree with I agree with you. Well, I'm <laughs> going to disagree with myself then because uh, oh, yeah, the, go ahead. The, the, the last question that you said was, in, I think in, in some universities, it's the, the uh, elegance of quantum information theory has made it interesting intellectually and it's, there are some courses being taught in it. And so I think one of the nice things about it, regardless of any applications, is that it teaches people a new way of thinking about communication, uh, interaction. Uh, it's penetrated even into, into cosmology now and, and the black hole physics, that the sort of the black hole firewall problem is the, is the recent manifestation of the physicists starting to think about no cloning principles. Uh, so I think it's, it has very, uh, for something that isn't very practical yet, it's got a lot of intellectual uh, appeal. And similarly, when people ask me, uh, what, is, uh, what is the speed up? What is the reason for, how much do I speed up of a, com of a computation problem do I get by using a quantum computer? I say you're thinking of it the wrong way. The computers are quantum. The kind that we know how to build today have the limitation that they have excessive eavesdropping. And if we could build a computer that didn't have eavesdropping on all of its intermediate thinking, it would be able to solve some problems faster. So there are no quantum speed ups, there are only classical slowdowns. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is certainly true that we are doing reasonably well as a community for the reason that Charlie mentioned, right? There's no multi billion dollar business behind quantum technologies, and yet, uh, a number of very bright students are attracted to this field, and the community has been rapidly growing. If you just look at uh, the history of the development of this field in terms of number of people working in this field, it is a significant increase, despite the fact that there's uh, still a conspicuous lack of uh, huge industry behind it. So I think in this sense, because of as Charlie said, it's intellectually pleasing and challenging to work out a few things. I, I think that in physics, lots of bright students used to go to study a high energy physics or so, and, and increasingly that trend changed over the last few years, uh, which actually shows something good about the field, that many people find it exciting and interesting. And, and you know, look even at this conference. I think when it started about four years ago, when uh, Stephanie and, and Matthias thought about it. There was just only uh, a small group of people, and I, I, I don't think we ever thought that this conference will explode within four or five years to the size it is today. 
So in a way, you know, yes, we are niche, but we are doing well in terms. Look at the derivatives, Renato. <laughs> We're doing fine. <laughs> okay, I think Paul has a question. You mentioned before BB84, there was the BBB82 or something like that. Yeah. I don't know why everyone had to be a B to work in your cadre, but that's okay. Uh, where you had a scheme where you could reuse the one-time pad. Correct. And it doesn't seem like it can be a one-time pad if it can be reused. So can you just, I, I, I can't even conceive what that would mean to be able to reuse the one-time pad. Okay, uh, well, the answer is simple. Uh, but, but you're right that at that point it should no longer be called a one-time pad. <laughs> uh, but, th th but this being said, the pad can be reused. And the idea was very, very simple. Uh, it, Claude Shannon proved that you need to have a secret key as long as the message, at least as long as the entropy of the message, to, to have perfect security. And moreover, uh, that this, uh, this key has to be random and unknown to the, to the eavesdropper. All this is well known. Now, when you use a one-time, and, and, and then he also proved that if you use this one-time pad, then no information leaks about the plain text. However, information will leak about the key. And that's the real reason why you should not, not use it again, because one, one, the first user to, of your one-time pad will leak information about the key itself. And therefore, if you reuse it the second time around, the, the condition that the key, that the user has no information about the key is no longer valid. Good. Now, so that's really why you should not reuse a one-time one pen. Now, if you send a message through a quantum channel, using one-time pads to encode it in various ways, which I won't get into detail, but you, in fact, we need two one-time pads here and there. But, but the bottom line is that if you use a quantum channel to send a one-time padded message, and if at the other end you detect that there's been no disturbance, well, if there's been no disturbance, there's been no eavesdropping. And if there's been no eavesdropping, then your pad is still safe. So you can continue to reuse the one-time, so-called one-time pad as, as long as you want. As lo in fact, as long as you detect no eavesdropping, strange thing to say. Uh, it's not that you don't detect eavesdropping, you detect there has been no eavesdropping. So as long as you detect there's no, that, uh, as long as there's been no eavesdropping, the one-time pad is safe and you can reuse it indefinitely. That's the basic idea. That, uh, yes, okay. that just a comment on um, Charlie's answer, which seems to, ans to me to answer one on on of his previous questions, which is why didn't, the, uh, didn't quantum information was discovered in the 30s to the 50s? And I think the answer why you say that nowadays people have a really um, intrinsic knowledge of quantum, of information problem, Shannon compression or whatever through computers, is something which started to go out of computer information to physicists in the 80s and 90s. And of course, what I think, but it's a vague idea, that you are one of the few people understanding that in the early 80s and in the 70s, because you worked on the links between physics and computing through the reversible computing approach. But and then, then the field really started in the late 80s, early 90s, when all physicists has a Mac on his desk and started to know that information is something you can put in a machine, really, I mean, concretely, and not something uh, an abstract product of the mind. I, know. I think there's uh, s something to that. Uh, not exactly that. I think you could a physicist could use could have gone on using computers, even today's computers, without, without tumbling to the idea that the, that the physics of computing had been, had been done incompletely in the 30s by, by uh, uh, Turing. So, but I think what happened is that there's uh, separate courses for education, separate tracks for the education of graduate students in computer science, information theory, informatics versus physics. And there weren't a lot of people who studied both. I accidentally got to study both because of uh, doing computing. I was a physics student, but I did a lot of computing. And I got interested in this thermodynamic question. 
Peter is also one, I, he had an unusual education in the sense that he knew a lot about factoring and he had taken a quantum mechanics course and most of his, his uh, peers didn't know enough quantum mechanics to think that way. And let's say, I don't know, what about Umesh? He was your person that you talked to a lot. Where did he start to learn to think quantumly? I think he started to learn to think quantumly after he saw, um, after he started working on quantum computers. Yeah. So I don't think he had any physics going into, into that. And, and Deutsch, of course, is a very unusual person, and Feynman was a very unusual person. So. Right. <laughs> Okay, other questions? If you like ideas, there may be ideas on the screen. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question um, yes. about here. Uh, technology. Uh, yes. Do you think there's some breakthrough of a technology to, we need some breakthrough, like for example, if we take fiber optics, which could not have been possible without a semiconductor laser, do you think some, something new should come out in order to, to really get this uh, quantum computing and quantum cryptography on big scale, I don't know, perhaps some people think of some kind of technology which should come in some years. You mean that there is a, a missing technology for quantum computing, like there was no, no, a missing perhaps. technology, it was a transistor yeah. was missing. Yeah, do you think uh, there's something the, like that could be? So. <laughs> The case? <laughs> it would be nice, but okay. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's uh, worse than that. <laughs> that uh, there, I used to joke that when the quantum computing became uh, a sexy field, that a lot of physicists looked around their laboratory and tried to figure out that some way of describing their equipment as uh, doing research in quantum computing and then apply for a grant for that. But uh, but in, in reality, though, there is competing ideas for quantum computing hardware. And a great deal of research has been done on what are the best kinds of hardware for the physical system for implementing communication or storage of quantum information or, or uh, quantum gates. And uh, there, there are several proposals, yes. I mean, five years ago or 10 years ago, there were like a dozen proposals and it's been narrowed down to several. Nobody knows which ones of those will work best or if there's some new thing that we haven't thought of yet that yes. will be better. Sure, well, what, what, many what? things we have looked at already and but they, so there are some, some forerunners, let's say, but it's still uh, like jumping. So there is uh, an event, so it seems, okay, this is a good one and then another one jumps over. And it has been like that in the last, uh, 10, 15 years, I think. But, but the, the analogy I like to make is that in the 40s, uh, when the first electronic computers were coming out, for instance, the ENIAC, um, it, was, it was just a big monster. The ENIAC weighed 30, 30 tons and was made of 18,000 vacuum tubes. And it was kind of the end of the line because these vacuum tubes have a tendency to blow up. And, 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 and by having 18,000 of them working at the same time was just about the, the biggest you could have so that you could replace them fast when they would burn. <laughs> um, and, and then, so that so was the end. You couldn't do anything bigger. And actually, the whole point is that now we get something, the whole point was to get things smaller, obviously. But, but the point I'm making is that, and then overnight, the transistor was invented. Overnight, but, but 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 when the transistor came out, suddenly the entire picture changed, a and we could do much 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 better and faster computers, classical computers. So again, it's, it's just an analogy, but what I'm I, I, when I see what's going on now, there are all kinds of, 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 of big monsters, uh, which are uh, experiments at quantum computing, and I'm not saying that badly. Uh, but perhaps there is one technology that nobody has thought of yet, and when it comes out, in three years we have a full-scale quantum computer. Uh, it might not happen, but it might happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why, why the question, when will we have one, is mostly meaningless, because the answer is just, we can't tell. The, the favorite time uh, somebody asked me when we would have a quantum computer, a journalist asked me in 1999, and I saw my opportunity. 
I say, I definitely promise you one in the next millennium. <laughs> <laughs> Once, one of my students uh, who was gi gi giving a prize talk for something was asked this question by the audience. And he answered, oh, I would say in about 500 years. And, and, and then I said, well, this uh, is probably the most optimistic prediction I've heard uh, for the survival of our species. <laughs> <laughs> OK, other questions? Oh, when you were describing the difference between a computer, when you were describing the difference between a computer and a physical experiment, you said that uh, a computer can have a general purpose, but for a physical experiment, you have to design a new one for every question you want to answer. So, does a quantum computer can ha can it have a general purpose, or it has to be designed for every problem that it has to tackle? Yeah. No, there you can build a general purpose quantum computer the same way you can build a general purpose classical computer, and you can prove all the same theorems about universal quantum computation. So once we get quantum computers built, then the, you know, the, the, act, the, the um, process of miniaturizing them and mass producing them is basically going to happen. It's just getting them to work in the first place. <laughs> Very difficult. I think that there is somebody here. Uh, okay, you have a microphone, but just take a microphone, otherwise. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. As you have uh, said, when we use computer, uh, com computer, uh, quantum cryptography, uh, we lose approximately the half of the information. So can, uh, how, can we, how can you deal with this problem? We, we you're saying we lose half of it. We, we, yeah, yes, because you know, uh, you have only the information when Alice and Bob choose the same, uh, <laughs> same axis. Well, this is a small price to pay First of all, the, 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 the loss of half of it occurs when you're trying to generate a key and you sacrifice some of it in order to be sure that the rest of it is secret. So it's a small price to pay. Well, this gets to the relation between uh, the simulation of uh, physics and, and physics. So nowadays, a great many experiments in which we think we understand the physical laws can be done in simulation on a computer. For example, uh, we don't have a great many wind tunnels anymore because we can do the calculations of the, of the, uh, of the hydrodynamic or the aerodynamic equations very well in a, a digital computer. But if you're dealing with some physical thing that you don't understand the laws that it follows, there's no substitute for, for doing the physics experiment. Hello. Thank you for, for the presentation. Um, I have a question uh, that looks like uh, sci-fi, but uh, I will ask it. Um, okay. uh, do you think that um, quantum physics could uh, explain the self-consciousness of the man? <laughs> and, and maybe, maybe uh, can we make uh, so, uh, artificial intelligence with a, a quantum computer? Philippe, why didn't you shut this thing down before somebody <laughs> asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> this was the risk of the game. Right? You got to <laughs> right. This is a good one for Archer to answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the no, but I would add that uh, uh, what do you mean by consciousness? <laughs> uh, I, I mean that um, maybe we, we are not able to, um, to know exactly what one person can do. And the, this kind of uh, indetermination could be related to uh, quantum physics. So um, I... Um so Roger Penrose has written this famous book that relates um, consciousness to 
quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and I, you know, as far as I can understand, his argument goes, we don't understand consciousness. We don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> consciousness is related to quantum mechanics. Well, I, I should defend Roger a little bit. It was, it was slightly more sophisticated than that. <laughs> uh, so. But uh, as, as an anecdote, I have to tell you that when, you, when your, your algorithm became known, I, I went into Roger's office and I, I said, well, you claim that there are quantum phenomena in our brain, in those microtubules, right? So, and now I have a refutation of this proposition. And I just wrote this big number and I said, can you factor it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's of course a joke, you know, that human evolution may, may have not preferred abilities of factoring as some kind of like essential for our survival. But uh, my, my reference was, so if there were sort of a quantum phenomena in the brain, so perhaps then you could be able just to look at the number and immediately tell what the factors are. This kind of question physicists will not answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other questions? Yeah. Here? I have two questions. The first question is, uh, there are a limited number of the uh, quantum algorithms. Is there any reason why only several, only the, the, the several algorithms? And the second question will be, what do you think about the post-quantum cryptography? P people claim, okay, there's some, some algorithm, the RSA is okay, RSA is solved, but they, they have some other pro uh, protocols based on the computational complexity assumption, but it's uh, invalidated. Uh, sorry, your algorithm is invalidated. So, yeah. Okay, so second question, what happens to public key cryptography after quantum computers are built? And well, one answer is that so far we do not, I mean there are other proposals for public key crypto systems. Among them are lattice crypto systems and um, crypto systems based on error correcting codes, and neither of these have been broken with quantum computers theoretically yet. So if, and lattice crypto systems are efficient enough that we could actually move to them if anybody, you know, actually decided to and made a big push to introduce new software and do everything that they need to do to change the public crypto systems which of course they haven't because there's an enormous amount of inertia. So assuming quantum computers can't break lattice crypto systems, there are safe public key crypto systems. And I'm trying to remember the first question is why haven't we discovered more algorithms? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Either they're out there and they're very hard to discover or there's only a very few things that a quantum computer can do and I don't know, I don't know which one I believe. The, the I do I, believe that yeah. after quantum computers are built, it'll be much easier to discover quantum algorithms for quantum computers. It, it might be also the case that we think about algorithms in terms of a classical problems, that there are certain decision problems that might, might be inherently quantum. For what I mean is that when you say algorithms, you, you think about the existing mathematical problem and you think, okay, here's a problem that I give to a computer, but, but suppose I, I redefine this in the following sense. Well, maybe one example just to clarify what I have in mind is this. I give you a, two particles and I ask you, are they entangled or not? So it is, it is a problem, it's a decision problem. You can say yes or no. And then we may have this kind of problems equivalent to what you may consider as, as an algorithm for, for quantum. And then this, this could be a very important question to answer, right? given to, well, say, given a certain number of qubits tell us something about entanglement or the character of entanglement. So, so it might well be that we still think about quantum algorithm in the wrong kind of way. Maybe we should actually extend the meaning of what is a, a quantum algorithm. I have sort of a compliment. Uh, I sort of heard that there might be something special about the quantum Fourier transform which makes that factoring and is easy. 
it's a, so it might be a subclass of algorithm involving the quantum Fourier transform. But since I'm not a computer scientist, it may be completely wrong. Did you hear about what, what is a characteristic of algorithm which perform well on a quantum computer? Is there a generic way to characterize them, or it's just a list? Didn't what, what, what Peter knows more about this than the rest of us, I think, but you said that the clue was looking for periodicity, that, that yes. that's something the quantum computer could do, and that, that, that's at least one. And for a physicist, periodicity is for it yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> but is there a link here? Or for well, not all quantum algorithms that have discovered yes. use periodicity, so there are some exceptions. Mm -hmm. but. So enough ex exception to claim that it's not a rule. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you said that one of the main differences between a computer and a physical experiment is that um, computer is uh, kind of adaptive. You don't have to build a new computer for each task you have to do. So and afterwards, you said that um, a quantum computer where um, more like a physical experiment. That, that imply that you, one would have to build a new quantum computer for each algorithm one would want to apply. Or would they be some kind of um, quantum Turing machine whose base logic would be not the usual Boolean one, but uh, one based on quantum mechanisms. Yeah. So in terms of needing to build a new computer for everything you want solved, a quantum computer is much more like a classical computer than like a physics experiment. So once you build a quantum computer, it can do anything that any quantum computer can do. You just need to know how big it is, how, or how, much, how many qubits it has, how much memory it has, how fast it is, things like that. Yes. Same metrics that a classical computer has. Thanks. If you don't know anything about co quantum computer, I uh, don't. so you, you, you have to change classical bit into qubits, which are basically quantum superposition, like polarized photons. And then you have to make gates, which are not classical gates, which are quantum gates. But if you have good qubits and go good gates, and if you are able to multiply them, you can, in principle, uh, construct a, uh, a computer, and there are ways to correct errors, etc. So it's a it's sort of a so-called circuit model where you build a quantum computer uh, like you build a classical computer, but the objects that you will manipulate are quantum objects, and for instance, you will get a lot of entanglement inside the computer uh, that you don't get in classical ones. Yes, but it's so a machine. It's a machine. Th there's um, much more engineering and technical difficulties than um, informatical uh, difficulties. It's, it it's, it? it's a technical difficulty. Yes. yes. Thanks. It, it's about the. Is it working? Yes. It's about the possibility, uh, the difference between an experiment and a computer. Ça marche le micro, Philippe? Oui, oui. Um, actually, there is an intermediate situation on which many groups are working, including mine at the moment, which is called quantum simulator. A quantum simulator is something between a real experiment and computing, we could call it analogous quantum computation. The idea is the following. If you have a system, for instance, electrons in a piece of matter, and uh, you want to understand better how it works, but when you have electrons in a piece of matter, there are not many parameters you can change. The density of electron is fixed. Uh, many parameters, the, uh, the height of the potential in which the, the electrons evolve is fixed. And uh, so basically, any, uh, the only thing you can do is change the temperature, apply a magnetic field, or apply a pressure and, that, and observe a conductivity. That's all you can do. On the other hand, if you are not sure you understand the system, but there are some smart theories who come with a very complicated quantum Hamiltonian, etc., and you want to understand better that Hamiltonian, what do you do? You build an experiment like the one we do, putting ultra-cold atoms in a potential that you engineer with laser beams, and then you can change the parameters. 
And so the system you have in front of you is solving, for instance, for the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, or solving for the dynamics of the system in that Hamiltonian. But the beauty of it is that, for instance, you can change the amplitude of the laser beams, so you change the potential. You can change it suddenly. There are plenty of things you can measure inside that you cannot measure when you have electrons in a piece of uh, copper or something like that. And so I think this can legitimately be called an analogous quantum computer, but the standard word at the moment is uh, quantum simulation. I think that's a promising direction, yes, and it's, it's, it's the language has gotten uh, confused because digital and analog are the words that are commonly used for discrete and continuous. Fully agreed. This is a confusion of language. Whereas this is an analog computer in the sense of something that is designed to be programmable to resemble a range of physical systems, although not all of them. Exactly. And by the way, this was the initial uh, idea of Feynman. When you read carefully yes. the paper of Feynman of uh, 82, 83, uh, what he proposed actually was this kind of quantum simulator. OK, there is a question up there. Uh, yes, you have the microphone. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, as Philippe Grangier explained, uh, QKD generates keys, and those keys can be used uh, for one-time pad information theoretics uh, encryption. But you can also use them to expand them, for example, in modern symmetric ciphers, because we we believe, and we believe, as far as we know, that those ciphers they are secure. I mean, we don't know how to break them, and maybe it's possible that they are secure for long term. I mean, maybe we we don't know exactly in which world we are. Maybe we are in a world where symmetric crypto will be secure for a very long time. So if this is the case, uh, probably we shouldn't do QKD, right? If I'm correct. But then what could we do in terms of quantum crypto? Yes. Uh, oh, this, this is, I think, emphasizing very much the point that Shield made. One of the objections that's sometimes raised to quantum cryptography is that so far, it doesn't have a very long range or a very big data rate, although people are working on it. Uh, so it's hard to generate very large volumes of key. Uh, but the point that you made is that uh, unlike the uh, public key cryptography, symmetric encryption, secret key cryptography, is not known to be uh, breakable by a quantum computer more than uh, quadratically faster than it would be on a classical computer. And so therefore, simply doubling the key size would give you an equivalent level of protection, as far as we know, from a quantum computer attempt to break a symmetric cipher. So the, and many of the practical implementations of, of, of quantum cryptography uh, put those two ideas together. They use the quantum key distribution to reseed the symmetric cipher much more often than it is feasible to do by hand delivering the key and, and changing it that way. So I think that potentially, although it doesn't give absolute security, that's a very promising uh, direction and a reason for developing uh, quantum key distribution. Yeah, and, and in fact, some uh, commercial products actually do that today. Like yes. ED Quantique has a uh, very fast encryptor. Uh, if I remember it, it goes uh, 100 gigabits per second. It's behind you. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and and the, the idea, as Charlie said, is to use quantum key distribution to change the keys as fast as you can. Uh, and, and, and even though a uh, symmetric cipher is not unconditionally secure, if you change the keys very often, then it makes it so much harder for the eavesdropper because he has to start again for each frame. He has to again start and, 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 and do cryptanalysis to find a key. And, he has even, and also he has, will have less, uh, less data 
And the more data you have uh, encrypted with the same key, the easier it gets. So just by changing the keys very often, and, and this can be incorporated into the product. They, so there is quantum key distribution to change the keys, but, but, the, but, 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 but then it's, it's classical encryption which is used, and, and that's, that's very promising. Okay, but maybe there is a question here. Uh, like the the fact that we rekey with we use quantum key distribution to re-establish the keys. It's because we believe that it's more secure. That if we do it like that, that if we expand keys with symmetric re yes. symmetric crypto, well, so it means no, we no, believe no. we are in the world with more secure. No, if if you use um, more traditional methods to. Uh, to increase the keys, by which I assume you mean a pseudo-random generator, um, then if the pseudo-random generator is broken, then you can, you, can, you can break the entire stream that has been encrypted with different keys. Whereas if each key, and e in each frame, you get a fresh new key, which is completely random, uh, it's, it's much, much, much harder to, br to break. Sir, what do you think if like, if it's a nice person like police and Alice and Bob are like terrorism, <laughs> and do you think that we can work on quantum research to to try to measure quantum state without changing it? Like, we can help the police. <laughs> Who wants to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Well, uh, the question, the question was is, a, is, a, is a moral dilemma here, yes. right? So. If Alice and Bob are not goodies but baddies, and uh, <laughs> Eve is a, a good person, like say Alice and Bob are terrorists, and uh, no such agency is a good thing, and try yeah. to listen to such. <laughs> so if, if the bad guys get the quantum crypto, wh what shall shall we do? <laughs> uh, well, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a moral dilemma, not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Serge Arouche, I asked help from, from Serge Arouche to try to measure the quantum state without changing it. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, but it's a different problem. If you, if you make uh, Serge Arouche, what he does is that QND measurement, uh, which is a change, measuring a, a quantum state without changing it, you can certainly do that in quantum mechanics, but it will not eavesdrop anything. Even if you do that, uh, it will not be a way to withdrop. Uh, uh, BB84 and QKD is secure even if you can do what Serge Arroche does, hopefully. <laughs> well, if, uh, if you refer to quantum non demolition measurement. Yes. But you know, actually going back to your question, it's, it, it is an interesting question about the sort of whole social context of cryptography, not only quantum cryptography, but secrecy in general. And I remember that my, for a certain period of time, my work was sponsored by uh, GCHQ. And what they were interested in was uh, not so much about uh, how good quantum cryptography is, but how, what a, how vulnerable it is. So, so they, they said, oh, you say that you have this security proof under such and such assumption, so you cannot break it. Well, we'll give you some more money. Work harder to see whether you can break it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so of course, the agency would be interested in having some kind of a trap door. Um, but uh, as always, you know, with anything new, there's a good way of using it and a bad way of using it, and depends very much on people. And as a scientist, you probably take a view that, oh, well, of course, you have you ask yourself those questions, but you cannot stop your scientific curiosity because of of this possibility that there will be a number of people who may actually abuse this discovery in a way that uh, that that is just not pleasant to the rest of human beings. Yes, Charlie? Also, in anticipating how something will be used, as I recall, uh, the, uh, when the telephone was invented, the or original idea that it might be used for was what would approximate radio. That is, there would be a broadcasting of things that people li would like to hear, like news and music that would come from a central station, go out through the wires to all these receivers. And then when the radio was invented, it was thought that it was going to be used uh, for the purposes that we now use the telephone. And now, then for many years, the, these, these, these things were used for the opposite purpose from what was originally thought. 
and now they're mixed together because all of our, our <laughs> cell phones actually use the radio. Okay, uh, still questions, or still several questions, okay. Uh, up there, maybe, you have the microphone, okay. Hi, uh, hello. So my question is about unconditional security or information theoretic security, which basically uh, is derived from Shannon's theorem, uh, meaning that the length of the key should be at least the size of the message. Now, let us imagine a completely hypothetical world in which Shannon had proved that perfect secrecy is not possible. So you have to use infinite resources in order to get an unconditionally secure message. And such a hypothetical world would quantum mechanics have somehow been able to violate this? Or um, So my basic point is quantum key distribution could still have been used for performing, for example, advanced encryption standard, but it would not have been able to use one-time pad because such a thing would not have existed. Well, you know, it's very difficult to answer a question where you just take one aspect of something and make it just different, keeping the rest of the reality as it is. So it would be like a little bit like asking yourself a question, you know, what would happen if in the United Kingdom you would introduce a right-hand traffic, but for lorries only. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think with, I don't know how to answer your question, really. I like your example, <laughs> lorries only. I would say it's, you could ask what would the world be like if the ratio of the mass of the proton to the electron was more like a, uh, uh, th th 100 to 1 instead of 1,000 to 1. Uh, but it's a little harder to ask what would it be like if, if Shannon's theorem about secrecy were not true because that's mathematical. That's like asking what would the world be like if pi were equal to 3 exactly. Oh, that we know. All the wheels will be hexagonal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me try to give a completely different okay. type of answer. So let's move to the next question. <laughs> um, let, let me try to give a different type of answer. Um, um, we know that there are things that uh, quantum information can do that is classically impossible. Uh, and in, in terms of quantum key distribution, one of these things is to start from a short secret and expand it into a longer secret, which is information theoretically secure. That is something that Shannon proved, or can be proved with Shannon's theories, impossible. Yet with quantum mechanics, we can do it. And there are many other examples in, in, there, in, the, in the area of, 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 uh, of communication. Not, not secret communication, but the efficiency of communication. There are some things that we can compute with exponentially less communication if we allowed entanglement than you would need if you were restricted to a classical world. And we can prove that classically it's impossible, yet we can do it, at least in theory. Uh, so at a one-time pad were impossible, uh, and we could, uh, but we could still, using quantum mechanics, do something impossible classically. It would just be one more example of those. OK, so we have one more question here. Uh, since the invention of BB4 protocol, in the previous uh, uh, 13 years, there have been a um, pr uh, fruitful uh, achievement uh, in both theoretical and uh, experimental aspects. So my uh, question is, uh, what are you expecting to happen in the next uh, 13 years, or what topic most attracts you in the future? For, for QKD, you mean? Uh, yes, Q yes. OK. So. <laughs> I thought one of us was supposed to talk about that. Uh, oh, it wasn't me, was it? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think we've seen such, uh, such uh, even at this conference, such uh, um, unexpectedly great progress in the, in the quantum cryptography area, as, as more so than in quantum computing that I think it wouldn't be surprising to see it applied over 
long distances, inter, uh, continental distances, and uh, uh, in this, not to be the, the, the generator of all the key that's used in all encryption, but to more, to, to increase the security of in, encryption in, in the internet in a, in a much bigger way than it does now. I think that's the, the future that we can expect for it. Uh, there will be maybe, I would say, before we can get uh, a, a quantum computer, there will probably be quantum repeaters so that we could have a long distance uh, uh, quantum uh, cryptography even without going to a satellite like that. Uh, yeah, okay. Just a little remark, we are going over time now, but uh, Vadim has a question. <laughs> Imagine if practical uh, factorization is available tomorrow by an, ad I don't know, an advance uh, in mathematics or a sudden availability of cheap quantum computer in whatever way, if, if we can do it. What do you think will happen to uh, our telecommunications, to our secure telecommunications over the next year or two? How the world will react? Mm. Well, I, I think that society will collapse, so that uh, what, what happens next is whether we'll uh, make war with sticks and stones or what. Um, no, seriously, th this again go, 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 goes about what I was saying earlier, that if we don't, uh, if we continue using insecure systems, knowing they're insecure, because they would only be broken in so many years, uh, but in fact, we have a bad surprise because they're broken tomorrow, then it's just a disaster. And, and, but, and, and one of the points you're making is that uh, we don't need necessarily have to wait for quantum computers to, to break the currently used systems because it, nobody has been able to prove that there is not an efficient class, classical algorithm to factor large numbers. And, 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 uh, and of course, not only could one of such algorithms exist, it could all be known already by people who don't, who don't tell. Um, so um, th there's a real risk that, 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 that the entire, when I said society would collapse, it's a bit too far, but, but that the economy would collapse, certainly. Um, um, and, and this can happen at any time. Um, so what would happen next few years after that, I don't know, but it would be chaos, for sure. Hmm. So do you think there will be a multi-billion application of quantum information, and what could that be? So, sorry. I think broadly defined yes. whether there will be a, the question if I understand is whether ever in the future there will be a, a multi-billion dollar industry behind <laughs> quantum information. A quantum technology is for sure. I mean, depends how you define this. I'm pretty sure that when you look into a high precise metrology sensing, uh, which many of those things can be phrased in terms of information if you take information as a physical entity. So yeah. yeah. I th my answer is yes. <laughs> it's a question of time, but probably sooner than, than we, many of us think. So maybe like, my answer would be like, perhaps not sooner than five years from now, but maybe not later than 50 years from now. <coughs> That's even allowing, uh, not allowing for the inflation, where the billion dollar <laughs> 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 Okay, so we are running a little bit late, but if there are still a few definitive questions, uh, one there. Okay. Could you briefly comment on the status and potential interest of uh, device independent protocols? So yeah, I missed well, the question. Like so. Whether we can comment up on the um, device independent cryptography, ah, but yes. then, then it's like opening a new chapter for the Z. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, uh, it's a okay. great idea. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> idea. It's a beautiful idea. It's, it's something you should be working on. <laughs> no, I, I'm just, it's, it's, maybe it's, it's a little not bit fair. too technical it's given no the time. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's not fair, but, but I think in order to 
I think it's a fascinating development and, uh, and it is something that I was referring to earlier, that this kind of idea that sometimes you think you have an idea and the idea is more clever than you. Uh, I, I think maybe I should have thought about it back in, in the 90s, but, but I couldn't see it. So, so the idea is beautiful and, and there are lots of beautiful developments. What I find interesting in the context of, of device independent that somehow this is a good example when cryptologists are pushing physicists to do certain experiments physicists probably wouldn't do. You know that there's no like a loophole free test of Bell inequalities, really. <coughs> if you want to close all these detection loopholes and you want to close the, um, uh, the uh, locality loopholes, I don't know, probably Paul Criad would be is in a better position to comment up on the existing state of the art. But, uh, but, but you know, probably most physicists wouldn't consider such experiment necessary. You know, you wouldn't really think that nature is so malicious that it would be cheating you in this way, in this class of experiments, and it would be cheating you on some other loophole in some other experiments. You know, nature is probably not malicious, but when you think about adversarial scenario where you have an eavesdropper, then eavesdropper can be malicious. So those kind of experiments make lots of sense for, for crypto applications, of course. And by doing such experiments, we finally may have an experiment where, which would be useful for the foundation of physics. So there's lots of interesting development going on there. Uh, and, but, but actually, to be fair, to give a sort of like a, a brief description of the device independent cryptography might be a little bit beyond what the chairman would like to see at this stage of <laughs> the chairman agrees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe a last few short questions. Uh, not too technical, if possible. Could you, uh, could you please give some comment on the uh, entanglement swapping based QKD? So recently, comments on so entanglement based entanglement QKD. swapping in, the, in uh, QKD, uh, uh, if I understood correctly your question. So, well, it plays like if you have quantum repeaters and relays, it plays a role for um, obvious role in extending the range. But I don't know whether that was the essence of your question. You you were. I mean, it's a good idea. It's used in uh, entanglements. You know that, that can be used to propagate entanglement over longer and longer distances if you have quantum repeaters, which requires quantum memories. Blah blah blah. So there's a bit of a story to this, but but thanks God we have entanglement swapping that helps. Okay. <laughs> I have a non-technical question, maybe, maybe a good one to end. So, it, you know, your stories, swimming and meeting and the whole Brownian motion aspect of how, how this all came about was one of the fascinating parts, I think, of, of the panel. I wondered if you could comment in general about um, if you think this, this way of finding new paths in physics is something that you, you appreciated, uh, that you thought maybe you, you regretted it happened to happen that way, or was it one of the beautiful parts of doing science? Um, in your careers, just happening to find people doing things and um, progressing that way? Progress in science um, requires collaboration between different fields, uh, multidisciplinary uh, research or interdisciplinary <coughs> research, and that uh, one, one way to make, to, to find things that others have not found before you is to bring in your own bag of tools, um, which are very familiar to you and others in your, in your, of your kind, but, but you bring them to a different field. So again, when Charlie uh, swam up to me in the ocean and started telling me about quantum mechanics, I didn't know anything about quantum mechanics, but I knew about cryptography. And he knew about cryptography somehow, but, but, um, but that was really my, my main area then. And, and he is a physicist. So, uh, this, this allowed us to have ideas that neither, neither of us uh, could have had by himself. Um, it was just a very lucky occurrence that we met there and, and, that, and that the sparks flied. But, um, but, but, but I would say that that is a general, general feeling I have that, that bringing ideas from one field to another uh, can be the, uh, really the, the secret 
for real progress. Yeah, and it's amazing how many things we take for granted. So probably, you know, what Gilles says is very much true, that at the early days of, of quantum information science, you had almost two different communities, computer scientists and physicists, and, and computer scientists wouldn't understand the notion of density metrics, and no. physicists wouldn't understand the notion of complexity classes, and then it took a while for those to develop a common language. And you know, I, it was interesting to see how those two communities started sort of converging, and now I have a feeling sometimes that they just passed each other. <laughs> <laughs> But, but actually, it was, this convergence was beautiful. <laughs> well, in terms of the Brownian motion, I think that it is more exciting and fun than frustrating that sometimes you make progress by trying to prove something false and then it turns out to be true, <laughs> or by making a joke and then the joke turns out to have some serious meaning. <laughs> Okay, so this may be a good way to conclude, and we are over time, so the, I would like to thank the speaker again. <laughs>